The Mid-Atlantic ADA Center, we are part of the ADA National Network. You can see we're number three on the, on the picture of the United States for Region 3. Uh, there are 10 regional centers and we all provide guidance, training, and materials and technical assistance on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Our number is 1-800-949-4232. And our website is adata.org. The Mid-Atlantic ADA Center's website is adainfo.org. And we will put that up on the screen at the end of the webinar. Slide 10, please. Welcome. I am so excited. I know that was a long introduction uh, to the webinar, Health Conditions, College Accommodations and Considerations. We are very, very lucky to have Annie Tolkien, who's the founder and director of Accessible College here, and um, with Rebecca Eli Long and Val Ir Irwin, who will be introducing themselves. Slide 11. Um, Annie is, has over 10 years in the disability field. She's a master's in special education from the University of Wisconsin and a bachelor's in secondary education at DePaul with a certificate in health coaching from Georgetown. Um, she spent nearly six years in the Georgetown University of uh, Georgetown University's Disability Support Services Office um, as Associate Director of the Center. She supported undergrads and graduate students and medical students with physical disabilities and health conditions with their accommodations and provided academic support services to the entire student population. So she was well qualified, is well qualified to start her own business, Accessible College. I am very excited. Annie, I am going to turn it over to you, longtime friend of the Mid Atlantic ADA Center. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Um, I'm so happy to be here with everyone today um, and to share this important topic. Um, so I'm Annie Tolkien. Today I am wearing a red shirt, red lipstick. I am a youthful 40-year-old woman. Um, I have a kind of mohawky pompadour style haircut, which is interesting to describe. <laughs> and um, I'm here in my home office in Silver Spring, Maryland. I have some diplomas on the wall behind me. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joining you. So as Anne mentioned, I'm the founder and director of Accessible College. Um, Accessible College provides college transition support services and preparation services for students with physical disabilities and health conditions. And health conditions is gonna be our focus today. Um, and so when, when I talk about health conditions and when we're talking about health conditions today, um, we might be talking about students who have um, a number, a variety of chronic health conditions. So things like POTS, lupus, cancer, autoimmune disorders, diabetes, chronic fatigue syndrome. We might also be talking about students with mental health conditions, some things like bipolar, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders. Um, and at Accessible College, I work with a number of students who have comorbid conditions. So they might have multiple health conditions, multiple mental health conditions as well. And I also support students with physical disabilities, as I mentioned before. So I work with students who use wheelchairs, maybe use mobility devices. I also work with students who are blind um, and visually impaired, students who, have, who are hard of hearing or deaf, um, and students who have those comorbid conditions of all of those pieces. So um, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about that today. And the reason that we're gonna be talking about this is because colleges provide varying levels of services and supports for students with disabilities and health conditions. Um, so some of the work that I do is kind of helping students and families bridge that gap so that they know the questions they should be asking, the things they should be considering as they're transitioning into the college setting. Um, as Anne mentioned, I have over 10 years of experience in the disability field. Six of those were spent as the associate director at Georgetown University. Um, there I worked specifically with students with physical disabilities and health conditions. But like many people in disability support offices, I, ha I wore a lot of hats. So I um, oversaw all of the housing accommodations for students on campus. I also provided academic support for the general student population, so study skills and academic support services and things like that. One of the reasons that I started uh, my business, Accessible College, was because I saw so many students at Georgetown who were coming in really unprepared 
for that transition to college. They didn't understand the types of accommodations they could request. They didn't really know their role in the accommodations process. And so um, that was a big catalyst for me to launch my business. Um, and, it's, and it's part of the reason that I wanna bring this information to everybody today to kind of demystify this process for a lot of people. Um, so many of the things that I worked on with students was thinking about kind of their their disability and their lives holistically, thinking through the types of accommodations they might need in the college setting and how that might be different from the high school setting. So my background as a university administrator really informs my process when I'm working with students and families today. And we can go ahead to slide number 12 and I'll hand it over to Val. Hi, my name is Val Irwin. Um, I have autism, dyslexia, LD, um, multiple learning disabilities, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and ADHD. I'm a PhD student at Bowling Green State University, and I study um, students with disabilities, um, particularly the ways policies and experiences outside the classroom affect the student experience. Um, my dissertation is on disabled student sexual assault survivors and their experiences with the university response to their sexual assault. Um, I'm a part of DREAM as well as Rebecca Eli. DREAM is um, disability rights, uh, education, activism, and mentoring, which is a um, organization that is um, a coordinating group of multiple different disabled student organizations across the country um, on college campuses. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca Eli. Oh, and I am, uh, I use they, uh, they or she pronouns. Um, I am a white woman with um, curly brown hair and I have um, brown glasses. Uh, and you can't really see my shirt, but it's kind of white and black pattern. And I am going to turn it over to Rebecca Eli and slide 13. Hey, thanks, Val. I'm Rebecca Eli Long. I'm a board member with DREAM, along with Val, and I'm also a PhD student at Purdue University. I use they, them pronouns, and as a visual description of myself, I'm a youngish white person, genderqueer person with short brown hair, and I'm wearing some dark rimmed glasses and a teal cardigan. I am multiply disabled. I mostly identify as autistic, but I'm also living with chronic pain and various other disabilities and health conditions. To let you know about my educational background and where I'm coming from, sharing my experience, I was homeschooled. So that really impacted the sort of college transition I had. And I have academically, I'm located in anthropology. I did my undergrad at Appalachian State University, where I double majored in art and anthropology. After a brief break, I returned there to complete my master's degree. And then this previous year, I started working on my PhD in anthropology and gerontology at Purdue University in Indiana. My dissertation research uses creative and arts-based methods to explore autistic special interests. And I'm really passionate about finding new and creative ways to do research as a disabled grad student, because I think it's a great way to challenge expectations about what research and what researchers look like. I also have some experience providing accessibility consulting for academic programs and academic societies. One of the projects I did most recently was a survey of campus members with a disability at Appalachian State University about the gaps and shortcomings that existed in their campus support services. And that project confirmed my own experiences that lots of students, as well as faculty and staff who have disabilities, were still experiencing a range of barriers. And I've appreciated that I've been able to use my own experiences and research skills to help advocate for equity with students with disabilities. So I will go ahead and pass it off to Annie and we can advance to slide 14. Super, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to share too, if you have questions or comments as this come, as we're going along through this webinar, we will have time for questions at the end, but if something is in your brain and you'd like to, to um, ask that question, you can go ahead and put it in the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. There should be a little questions box where you can 
um, write in your questions so you don't lose that train of thought in that moment. Um, let's look at the agenda for today so you know what we're going to be covering. So we'll do um, a little brief overview of college disability statistics, so just looking at the information that's out there. We'll look at the laws and accommodations in college. We'll talk a little bit about the college search process. We'll look at the college accommodations process. We will look at some emergent themes and some issues. We're gonna talk about self-advocacy and self-advocacy fatigue, which is a real challenge that a number of students face. We're gonna hear some student perspectives from Val and Rebecca Eli. We're gonna talk about support networks and tools that are available to support students with disabilities on campus, specifically students with health conditions and mental health conditions. And then we'll take your questions. So let's go ahead to slide 15, please. So here on slide 15, in order to contextualize this whole conversation that we're having today about the transition to college um, for students with health conditions, it's important to look at the data. So here's what we know. So we know that um, the federal data indicates that approximately 19% of undergraduate college students report having a disability. Those disabilities include learning disabilities, ADD, mobility impairments, psychiatric impairments, and health conditions. And I should note too that some of the language might be different than the language that you use in, in your um, areas of expertise. So in college, it's common to say learning disability instead of learning difference. It's also common to say mobility impairment um, or mental health condition. Here in the federal data, they used psychiatric condition and they used health condition for chronic health conditions. But students with hearing impairments um, or blindness or hard of hearing or deaf typically fall under the mobility uh, side of things in the federal data. And that's one of the challenges we have with gathering data just across the board, <laughs> since there are lots of different ways to kind of categorize th things. So these are the students, though, this 19 percent, those are the students who have gone to the disability support office and requested accommodations, gone through the accommodations process. And so we can expect that there are likely another 19 percent of students who would qualify for accommodations, but have either chosen not to request accommodations or they don't know how to request accommodations. So this makes students with disabilities um, the largest minority group on any given college campus, um, much like people with disabilities in general are the largest minority group in the United States. Um, we also know from some research that the Association of Higher Education and Disability has done, that research indicates that, that disability support offices um, are seeing the largest increase for accommodation requests for students with mental health conditions, which is, is, is an interesting trend to watch because it means that, um, you know, there are a lot more students who have mental health conditions and also have functional limitations related to those conditions who are seeking accommodations in the college setting. Let's go ahead and go to slide 16. Let's talk a little bit about the laws that govern the college accommodations process, just so we're all grounded. Go ahead to slide 17. Um, so we know about the data. Now we need to know about the laws. So first we have the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or ID, IDEA, IDEA. Um, this is the law that governs special education services and supports for students with disabilities and provides for free and appropriate public education and services in the K through 12 setting. Um, if your student has an IEP, an individualized education program, then it's because of this law, it's because of IDEA. If the student's in a private school, if you're working with a student in a private school, those schools are not bound by IDEA. However, that leads us to section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which protects against discrimination on the basis of a disability. So the student might have what's known as a 504 plan, um, and that outlines their accommodations. So private and public schools have to adhere to Section 504, and Section 504 applies to the K through 12 setting and to college as well. Um, when we move into college, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which provides for reasonable accommodations in the college setting, and I'm doing air quotes of reasonable accommodations because it leaves a lot um, up to the college to kind of navigate and figure out what's reasonable in the college setting. 
Um, and a big difference between high school and college is that in college, the student has to be prepared to engage in what is known as the interactive process. Um, they have to be able to request their own accommodations. Um, so in high school, typically parents are really involved in engaging and connecting with teachers and administrators, maybe advocating on behalf of the student. But then when the student gets to college, if they're seeking accommodations, they need to be able to do that by themselves independently. So that type of preparation requires time and it requires a really intentional and sometimes gradual approach to getting the student used to self-advocating. Um, and finally, here we have the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, um, and that's the law that typically surprises a lot of family members. Um, and what it does is essentially when the student matriculates to college, when they sign that dotted line and they've committed to whatever college, whether it's a vocational school, a community college, or a four-year institution, um, FERPA prevents the college from sharing information with the student's family, such as grades, class schedules, um, disciplinary actions. Um, students can opt to sign a FERPA waiver through the registrar's office, typically, um, and they would do that with their parents so that their parents can have access to that thing or their guardians can have access to that those things and that information. Um, but it's just a really interesting thing, I think, for most parents to understand that even though they may be contributing or paying for that tuition, they don't have access to that information anymore. So that's something that catches parents off guard. Let's go to slide 18, please. Um, this uh, slide here has a visual representation of a chart and the top part says accommodations and on the left side it has high school and on the right side it has college and we'll walk through some of the differences between high school and college accommodations. Um, so in high school, students with disabilities are typically identified by the school. The teachers and the administrators usually know about all of the accommodations as they're defined in the student's IEP or 504 plan or in an academic plan. Some private schools use academic plans um, instead of an IEP. Um, so in college, it's the student's responsibility to disclose a disability um, and provide documentation to the disability support office. So the student needs to be comfortable talking about their disability and talking about their needs. Um, in high school, the school usually takes the lead in arranging for accommodations. So for example, if your student gets extra time on a test, which is a, a common accommodation for students with health conditions or students with learning disabilities or anxiety disorders, um, the school usually knows when the student is in high school and they make those arrangements for the student. But in college, the student has to engage in that interactive process with the disability support office and arrange the accommodations. And at most colleges, that means that um, they'll have to actually work with the disability support office. Most disability support offices have a process where a student can take a, an exam with extended time with the disability support office that usually requires the student to make a reservation at least seven days in advance. So as you can see, there's a lot more steps in the college process, right? So the student has to have good organizational skills, executive function skills. They have to know when their exams are coming up and be able to plan for those things so that they've made a reservation in order to receive that accommodation. Um, and finally on this slide, um, in high school, the teachers usually identify when the student needs support. And the teachers and administrators in a high school, they can connect with the parents and share information. But in college, it's different. The student has to be proactive in seeking out support. So that means going to office hours and connecting with their professors. It might mean hiring tutors or taking advantage of some of the tutoring services that their school offers. Um, taking advantage of maybe any academic support services or coaching services that their school offers. Um, so that's a really big shift because the students have to be able to identify when something isn't working and they need to know where to go when they need support, which can be another kind of barrier um, for students with disabilities in general. So this is why it's really critical to start working with students as early as possible so that they start to develop these self-advocacy skills and start to develop an understanding of what their needs might be as they transition into college. And we know that transition services really vary from high school to college. 
um, and from school to school and from school district to school district, quite frankly. Um, so if your student has an IEP, um, an individualized education program, they transition is built into that IEP process. They're supposed, the school is supposed to be talking with the student about transitioning to post-secondary education or to employment. Um, if your student has a 504 plan, it can be a little bit different. So students with 504 plans don't receive any transition support services. So for students with health conditions that might fall under um, a 504 plan, they don't really get a lot of information about transitioning to college and the things that they should be looking at and considering in terms of the types of accommodations they might need or taking a critical look at the holistic accommodations that they might need if they're living away from home for the first time. Um, and so that's what I spend a lot of my time working with students and families on, are those pieces of thinking through each part of their day and what their needs might be and supporting those students and figuring out how they can best communicate those needs in the college process and to the disability support offices. So let's go to slide 19, please. So what does the ADA say about health conditions? Um, the ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. So if the student has a health condition or a mental health condition that substantially limits a major life activity that impacts their functioning, it's a disability in the eyes of the ADA. So for students, um, their health condition or their mental health condition might impact, impact their ability to attend class. It could impact their ability to stand or to sit for a long period of time, to walk long distances. There might be impacts on their memory, on their writing, and more. So there's a lot of things to consider in terms of health conditions, the ADA, and the transition to college. So chronic health conditions, just to give you an example of some types of chronic health conditions, um, some of the ones that I wrote down here were Crohn's disease, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, cancer, migraine disorders, um, arthritis. So there are a number of chronic health conditions that could impact a student's ability to engage fully in the college process, both in academics and it might impact their needs in, in housing and transportation. Um, students with mental health conditions, some examples of mental health conditions that I wrote down here on this slide um, were bipolar, anxiety, schizophrenia. So students might be taking medications that could impact their, their ability to be fully present in the classroom that might cause brain fog um, or have other side effects. So that might be where the functional limitation lies for a number of students with mental health conditions. But the key question here is, how does this condition impact the student? So it might be in the academic setting, there might be impacts in the campus setting, the housing, the transportation, the dining, and those are the types of things that students need to be thinking about as they're moving to college so that they're asking the right questions and connecting with the right people and asking for the right things. Let's go ahead and um, move to slide 20, please. So um, one thing that's important to understand is that, you know, the, I've, I've mentioned that college accommodations apply to all areas of college and campus life because usually people think, oh, accommodations are just going to be for the academic setting. And I want to make it clear that students could also request accommodations for housing, for residential, for dining. Um, and there might be other things to think through as well if they need programmatic accommodations to attend events and things like that. Um, one thing that can be tricky is if a student's had a condition that's been maybe more controlled when they were at home, living with their family, um, they might still need accommodations in the college setting to address some of these pieces around dining or around um, residential needs. So you might have students who maybe didn't have formal accommodations in the high school setting, but need them as they're going to transition to college and live more independently. Um, and so Let's look at some examples of accommodations for students with mental health conditions. And these are just kind of typical accommodations meant to give you a better understanding of what types of accommodations a student may need. Um, so extra time. And this could be an accommodation because of brain fog from medication. It could be um, because of anxiety. That's another reason that someone might need extra time for exams. A laptop in class, um, or a note taker 
This might address some of the medication pieces related to brain fog, flexible attendance. Um, and each college has their own policy around how flexible attendance kind of works in that college setting. Typically, it's a conversation between the student and the professor um, to determine you know, how it's gonna look and how things should work in that classroom setting. So it's contingent on the professor. Um, and it can't compromise the curricular goals of the course, which um, is really important for students to be talking with their professors to make sure that they're on the same page about what the expectations are. Um, many students who have flares in their condition might need flexible attendance. So if you have a mental health condition that has a flare and, and you need um, you know, the, the ability to miss class, then that might be an accommodation to consider. Another accommodation um, is having a reduced course load. Many schools require that students um, are full-time students and they have to get special um, an, a, an accommodation to be a, a part-time student. Um, the challenge with this, with taking a reduced course load, is that it can impact financial aid. But for many students, this reduces stress and can allow them to seek treatment if they're in a treatment program, a mental health treatment program or an addiction treatment program during school. They may need that reduced course load in order to be able to continue on with their education. So that's another type of accommodation that students might be seeking. Um, in terms of residential accommodations, um, so for students with mental health conditions, you know, it, it might be requesting a single room. And again, each college is a little bit different in how they evaluate these accommodations. Mostly with housing accommodations, they look at the documentation and the students need. And then, and then it's a space availability issue too. So um, that's another piece of that factor. Sometimes uh, students ask for fewer roommates. Um, a lot of times schools have dorm rooms, residence hall rooms that are larger and have, you know, you can have five or six roommates. So if you know that that's not going to work for you, then, you know, you might need to request fewer roommates. Also, room location. Students don't recognize that they can, can request, you know, a specific type of room location. If they have a trigger, like let's say an elevator or stairwell would be triggering for them because of uh, their mental health condition, they can request a, a room location. Um, and usually these things are done through the Disability Support Office in conjunction with the Housing or Residential Living Department. Um, in terms of dining, this is a question that I get a lot from a lot of people. Um, you know, some students have special diets that they're on because of their mental health condition in order to mitigate some of the challenges that they experience. So if they are, or if they have an allergy, you can always request dining hall accommodations. That's usually a separate process through the dining, um, the dining services, but the disability support office should be able to point students in the right direction to figure that out. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the, the mental health condition, typical types of accommodations that we might be talking about. Let's go ahead to slide 21, please. So for students with chronic health conditions, um, there's, a, there's, there's a bunch of other types of accommodations and a bunch of other reasons why they might need these accommodations in, in, high, in college. So um, for academic accommodations, um, students might need um, extra time, and it could be because of fatigue. Um, I work with a number of students who have um, different syndromes like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or POTS or other types of autoimmune disorders that are really, quite frankly, exhausting. So they get, they get tired out a lot easier and, and that can be really challenging for them. So um, it might be because of that that they need the extra time. A computer in class, um, that might be because of arthritis or hypermobility in order to take notes. Sometimes it's easier for people to use a laptop. Um, sometimes people need to use recording equipment as well. So that might be a, you know, using their computer or their phone to record the lecture. Um, flexibility and attendance is a big one for students with chronic health conditions, especially if they have um, conditions that have unpredictable flare-ups. So students who have Crohn's disease or migraine disorders who don't always know when those conditions are going to flare up. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be, that's the type of accommodation that they might want to consider requesting. Um, the ability to stand or to sit. Um, a number of students that I work with have arthritis or other conditions that um, 
where they really need to get up and move around and take breaks or have a standing desk. These are all the types of things that students can request from the Disability Support Office. Priority registration is um, another one that can be really helpful, especially if they have medication management or, or just medical management concerns that they need to take care of. Um, I work with a couple students who have some pretty extensive medical management things that they need to do in the morning as a routine. And so they, you know, they were concerned about having 8 a.m. classes and how that would work. And so they requested priority registration in order to select classes that would work for them in terms of managing their conditions. Um, and so that's another thing that students could request um, if they have a chronic health condition. Um, in terms of residential accommodations, this might be a single room if somebody has a migraine disorder or a condition where they need more rest or recovery or they're immunocompromised or there are some other issues. There might be some needs to request that, that single room. It could also be a lower floor if you have a student who has um, more mobility related challenges. Um, you know, emergency evacuation is something people don't always talk about, but you want to make sure that they're able to get out of the building um, efficiently if there is an emergency. So a lower floor could be something that they need. It could also be room location. Maybe some students want to be closer to a stairwell or closer to an elevator. Um, some students with chronic health conditions might also need a private bathroom. Um, you know, that could be really helpful for someone with Crohn's disease or someone who uh, has a bowel routine that they're doing or things that they need to manage where they might need more time in the bathroom. Um, in terms of dining accommodations, it's the, the ones that we discussed previously too, special diet, allergy free. It could be assistance in the dining hall. Some students that I work with who have mobility impairments related to their chronic health condition um, need support in carrying a tray or with food selection. So these are the types of things that students should be thinking about more holistically and actually inquiring about with the Disability Support Office. Um, it might also be accessible transportation too. Um, so students might need access to whatever campus buses. Sometimes Disability Support Offices after, uh, offer point to point for students on campus so that they can get from one class to another or they'll arrange a room relocation. So those are just other types of accommodations that students might be considering. Go ahead to slide 22, please. So the student plays a big part in the process when it comes to college, and let's look at those expectations now. So go to slide 23. So the student needs to be able to apply for accommodations. So they have to be able to talk to the disability support office. Um, tell the Disability Support Office folks what their conditions are and know their needs, and they have to provide documentation of a disability. Um, that really requires them to have great self-advocacy skills, to be able to discuss the accommodations with each of their professors, communicate with the Disability Support Office, potentially communicate with their roommates about what their needs are, so starting early on those self-advocacy skills is really, really important so that students are starting to develop those skills prior to getting to college. Students need to have self-awareness and knowledge. So they need to be able to identify when something's not working and they need to know who they can go to to get feedback and support to try and straighten the course out or get the support that they need. And that can be really tricky, especially in a college environment where they might feel a little bit intimidated. So students should be connecting with that disability support office and making those inroads so that they have a support network in place. Um, understanding the college expectations. I quite frankly don't think we talk about this with students enough. Um, understanding that they might not have the same accommodations from high school. It's a lot of families think that an IEP or a 504 plan will translate directly to the college setting and that's not the case. So the college will evaluate the documentation that they're provided. It's important to remember too that at most colleges, 504 plans and IEPs are not considered primary documentation. So students would have to bring um, either a full neuropsych evaluation, a letter from their healthcare provider, um, a psychological evaluation if it's a mental health condition or a letter from their psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, each disability support office at every university 
will have their own documentation guidelines. So it's really critical that families are looking those up, seeing if their kid is interested in a specific university, go to the Disability Support Office web website and look up what are the documentation guidelines, what are the expectations for students. It's usually outlined on the Disability Support Office's website, and it can vary from school to school, so that's important to know. Um, so in addition to understanding the expectations in colleges, um, independence is really required. So students really, really, really need to be aware that their parents are not really a part of this process anymore. Because of FERPA, um, parents aren't, aren't going to be chiming in for their student. That doesn't mean that parents don't still do that. They, they do sometimes. But usually the response from the school will be that, you know, they want the student to connect back with them and they'd be happy to work with the student. So students have to be able to navigate some of these systems and processes by themselves. Um, let's go to the next slide, uh, slide 24. So during that college search phase, um, there's a lot of work that students can be doing to make sure that the college that they choose is going to be a good fit. I mentioned that colleges really vary. So um, colleges provide varying levels of supports and accommodations. When you put that out and you know that going in, you, the student or, or the parents or the, care, the service provider can help the student kind of think through what are the things that you need, what are these colleges that you're interested in, what are they offering. Um, individual colleges have their own process for requesting accommodations, so students need to really do their research and understand how, how do I do this? How do I request the accommodations and how do I engage? So what can the student do? The student can connect with the Disability Support Office prior to applying and prior to committing. Some Disability Support Offices will actually have a conversation with the student and talk through typical accommodations. They won't likely look at the student's documentation prior to the student committing to that university, but the student can still ask questions about the typical accommodations for students who have their, their um, similar conditions and get a sense and get a, a vibe, really, of what the people in that disability support office are like. Um, they should research, students should research the supports that are available on the campus in general. So look at the counseling center, student health, health education, are there groups available, are there support services? Students can look at the services that are offered for tutoring on campus. Is there a writing center? Is there academic support that's provided? Some colleges now have academic coaches and students can meet with them, um, you know, once or twice a week or a couple times a semester. Every school is a little bit different. So you'd want to know up front kind of what you're getting into. Students need to also be able to identify their own medical needs and their considerations when they're looking at colleges so that they're thinking through, what do I need to have close by? What's important for me to have on campus? What are the things that I need to bring with me? So there's a lot of moving parts. Go ahead to the next slide, slide 25. So some of the issues that have come up um, with a number of the students who I work with who have health conditions, mental health conditions, physical disabilities, Transfer of healthcare is a real challenge for a lot of families. Um, sometimes people don't think through what's going to be involved in finding new healthcare providers, um, either closer to that college or who have the expertise that they need for their student's condition. Medication management, that's something we can start working on a little bit earlier with students too, so that they're starting to figure out, how am I managing my medication? How do I keep track of what pills I've taken? How do I make a refill on my prescription? So families can start to work on those a little bit um, earlier as well. Mental health services on campus, it's important that people understand that most college counseling centers will see a student for somewhere between three to six times, depending on the school, and then they're gonna refer them out to someone in the community because most college counseling centers are, are quite frankly saturated and um, will only see people on a short-term basis. So if you know that your student has a mental health condition and is gonna need more consistent support, you may wanna factor that into your transition process so that they're thinking about how am I finding a new mental health healthcare provider or am I able to do video chats with my current provider? And preparing that student for communicating with administrators and professors. That's really huge. Um, it sometimes can be intimidating, so it's really important that students are prepared to have a script and to practice that script. 
So the things that students can do, they can connect with the Student Health Center, look at their websites, look at the Counseling Center's website. It usually spells out how many times the students will be able to see someone in that Counseling Center. Investigating insurance, that can be a really helpful thing for the student and the family to do ahead of time. So if the student's going out of state, you'd want to know, will my insurance be, you know, will my student be covered in that state? Do they need to get different insurance um, through the university? research on that healthcare providers in that area. Many of the students I work with need occupational therapy or physical therapy, or um, they need a specific types of injections or, or things like that. And so you'd really wanna know up front if you can get those things at that school or in that area. And starting to work earlier on on those self-advocacy skills, that's really, really critical. The earlier we can start to engage students in these processes, even if they're a little bit reluctant, the more familiar that they're gonna be with that process in general, um, and that's really critical. So let's go on to slide uh, 26. And here I'm gonna hand it over to Val and Rebecca Ellie to kind of take the, take the next part of this presentation. So Rebecca Ellie, I see you, or Eli, excuse me. Rebecca, Eli, I see you now. You go ahead and jump in. Great, this is Rebecca Eli. We can go ahead to slide 27. So I'm going to talk a little bit about self-advocacy from a student perspective, which is a little bit what Annie covered, but I'll go ahead and tell you a bit about my experience with self-advocacy and the accommodation process, which colleges and universities are required to provide, but it's not always easy for a student to get these and it is the student's job to request these accommodations. This process must be initiated by the student, and this will have to go through the university's official channels, usually through an accommodation office with a name like the Disability Resource Center, Office of Disability Support, that type of office. So once a student has decided to attend a college, they've been accepted, they've finalized that decision, they should reach out to the Disability Services Office as soon as possible. It's also the student's responsibility to provide documentation and pay or find financial support for getting this documentation. So this can take a lot of time and can be a pretty big barrier for many students. I hear anecdotally a lot of students say that they know they qualify for a disability, but just getting the paperwork in order is too big a barrier. So this is a great thing to start working on with a student as soon as possible. Especially because testing, you might have to redo some assessments to make sure documentation is up to date. So this is definitely something to get in place as much as you can before school starts. Colleges may have a specific form or a letter for any documentation to follow. And I've had schools want a very specific template followed. I've also had had schools take just like documentation from a regular office visit that listed the diagnoses on file for me. So that's something to check in with a school about as well. It's a great idea to go ahead, like Annie said, to review the Disability Services Office website. Sometimes you can find a list of the common accommodations that they're used to providing. And this can give you a good idea of what you might want to start asking for. Sometimes you might need an accommodation that's less common and that might not be featured on their website. Just because it's not on a university's website doesn't mean you can't ask for it. It's also worth thinking about housing accommodations. If your student is going to be working on campus, they might also need a employment accommodations for that, accommodations around parking. These can all sort of be handled in a separate office. So usually the disability services office can point you in the right direction, but you might have additional paperwork or processes to track down across campus. So this is a lot of self-advocacy work to do even before you get to college. And then once you've gathered all of this documentation, you'll meet with someone in the Disability Services Office. And this person will work with you to make an accommodation plan. They'll probably consider the accommodations you've requested, and they might also have suggestions for accommodations that they might think would be a good fit. 
And sometimes I've had accommodations like priority registration that are just added to every student's accommodations plan by default. So once this has all been finalized with the Disability Services Office, then the student gets a letter to share with each instructor. And I've had this be a paper letter in the past, but it's probably going to be a digital email or not, it actually won't be an email. It'll go through some secure web portal and it'll be the student's responsibility to share this which, with each of their professors as soon as possible. Accommodations often aren't retroactive, which means that students should make sure professors get this letter in time to provide any of the accommodations. And depending on the type of accommodations that a student has, they'll probably end up having a short conversation, maybe an email exchange, maybe over office hours to work with each professor to decide exactly what those accommodations will look like. For example, if you have an accommodation for extended testing time, you might take the test with the Disability Services Office, or you might take that test in the professor's office or in an empty classroom. And accommodations could look different if you're taking a lab, if it's a seminar format, if it's a lecture. So it's really worth taking time early in the semester to figure out exactly what those accommodations might look like because they will vary from class to class and situation to situation. Generally, instructors won't be able to provide accommodations that aren't on that official paperwork, but I found a lot of instructors will work with a student within reason. There are some concerns about bias if they're providing accommodations to students who don't have official documentation requesting that, but depending on the situation, professors are hopefully often really willing to help and support students. And another thing students should know about discussing accommodations with professors is that this is a confidential information and professors will hopefully not be sharing this information with others. So the professor will be going into this conversation only knowing the information that's on the letter from the Disability Services Office which will just list the accommodations. This won't list any diagnoses. So the student might choose to disclose an ad additional information about the type of disability or chronic health condition they have, but this is completely up to the student and if they feel comfortable. For example, if I tell professors that I'm autistic, that might help them better support me and understand my needs but it might also like honestly reveal their biases and stereotypes about what they think an autistic person looks like. And I've had some very unhelpful conversations. I've also had instructors not really realize that this is confidential information that they shouldn't ask about. So if a student should not feel pressured to disclose a specific type of disability. So we can go ahead and move on to the next slide, which will be slide 28. So everything I said is a lot of work. And this slide has a picture of uh, someone who's a young adult, looks like holding a binder with a head on their or a hand on their forehead, looking exhausted. Because all of this self-advocacy is a lot of work and it leads to something that some people call self-advocacy fatigue. So college is already a lot to handle. And unfortunately, being a student with a disability means you often end up working much harder in an environment that's already pretty stressful. So for me, one of the most demoralizing things was to experience struggling adjusting to college, particularly around mental health issues, and being told to reach out for support when it felt like supports weren't really there. For example, I'd be told to ask for help, but the resident assistants in my dorm weren't equipped to understand autism and what that might look like, and the counseling center immediately wanted to refer me off campus. So it, when you're researching schools, looking at these support offices, it's great to know they're there. It's also great to recognize that students can still run into barriers getting that support and 
it can often lead to a lot of work and exhaustion, finding places to get that support, maybe more off campus. And self-advocacy, it's often about yourself and your own needs, but sometimes you can also end up in a campus climate that is not very welcoming to students with disabilities. For example, I take a lot of courses in a gerontology program, and the mindset of a lot of people is based around curing and preventing disability in ways that aren't very sensitive towards disabled students. So depending on where a student is in terms of academic discipline, they can also end up in a position where they are educating the campus community more broadly about disability issues as much as they are advocating for their own individual needs. And it's probably not surprising that disabled students are a lot less likely to feel like they belong on campus and even to drop out. And feeling burnt out and exhausted is common. And I would say even as a grad student, probably especially as a grad student, so it's really important for students to know that it's okay to put their own needs first. And some of the strategies I have used for dealing with burnout and self-advocacy fatigue, I think it's always important for students to try to find a community of other students with disabilities and health conditions where possible. Some campuses have disability cultural centers. Campuses might have mentoring programs. And these can be really great ways for students to connect with peers or people who have similar lived experiences. And as much as I think building connections to other students with disabilities and health conditions has been really helpful for me, I also recommend that students locate allies, particularly people with power to change things or help a student navigate college. For me, this person is primarily my advisor but it could be someone else in the university staff or faculty. And knowing that there's someone who has my back and who will fight for me and will take some of the self-advocacy work off my plate when I'm really overwhelmed has been really important to my well-being. I have this on the slide because I do think it's really important to pick your battles. Because unfortunately, if a student tries to advocate around every single disability issue, it can really increase fatigue. And then you run out of time to study or to participate in other activities that the student came to college for. So it's okay to take a step back and to focus on things that a student absolutely needs to get through the day. And the last strategy I listed on the slide is something that became really important to me this past year. I started being very upfront about the amount of time and work that self-advocacy takes. For example, I went into one of these beginning of the semester meeting with a professor to discuss accommodations, but I didn't have the time to prepare for the meeting as well as I would have liked. So instead of apologizing for being unprepared, I was honest that I had had to spend the time I would have otherwise been preparing for the meeting, but I had ended up having to follow up with the accommodations office because they were reluctant to provide me with a note taker for a couple of my courses. This isn't a strategy that works well for every student, but I do think it's something that is particularly effective when a student is interacting with professors or advisors who are very well-meaning, but are maybe not familiar so much with disability or chronic health condition issues. And I found that this helps kind of educate professors and advisors a little more about what college is like for students with disabilities and health conditions. So we can go ahead and move on to slide 29. And I think Annie will pop back on and Val and I will talk a bit about our student perspectives. Yeah, um, so I wanted to have Val and Rebecca Eli talk about just kind of their experience in college and what it's been like for them. Um, so why don't we, um, I, if you don't mind, I can ask you guys a few questions. Um, so Rebecca and Val, maybe in Re Rebecca, you just shared a, a little bit about just like how your process has been. But what have been what what have been the things that you guys have learned? Um, that you would want someone else to know 
as they're entering into the college accommodations process? What are some of the key kind of takeaways and things you'd like to share? And either of you can start. Is anyone eager? <laughs> Val, you chuckled first, so you can maybe you can go first. So for me, um, one of the things that has been greatly important is to know that um, different disability services offices are very different. Um, I remember I did the thing Annie suggested of going to the different disability services when I was deciding on colleges. And I remember there was this one office where there was one person in the office and there were books stacked to the ceiling. And like she was talking about how professors barely listened to her. That was a big red flag. Um, and then I went to another office where they were really accommodating. They knew exactly what they were talking about. And it was a very drastically different experience. Um, I remember that was like a really big eye-opening experience of how drastically different they could be. Um, similarly, as a graduate student, I've been to a couple different colleges and universities. Um, my first, my undergrad institution, which was Michigan State University, was amazing. Um, they really created what I often call as like a smorgasbord of accommodations that I would never have even considered and really helped me to create like a plan that really helped me be successful in college and one that I've used on all the previous, um, that the later accommodation things. And one of the things that I noticed later on was it was really important for me to know the accommodations because that smorgasbord was no longer a part of the accommodation process. And it was more of fighting for the accommodations that Michigan State was given really freely and now was more adversarial in nature. So really trying to figure out how to adapt to those different scenarios of display services and, and understanding what you need and also being creative in your thinking of how much I need to be thinking about what I do need ahead of time, um, because you cannot always guarantee um, someone to be like interactive and helpful with you when you're going through this process. That's great. Um, and I heard, I mean, there was a couple things that you said that I think are just really important to point out. You, and I, I say this to people all the time. If you've seen one disability support office, you've seen one disability support office. <laughs> so the things you might get at one school don't always transfer over to another college. So that's really important for people to know. Um, and Rebecca, Eli, how about you? Like, how did you, how did you manage your college search? What were the things that you were kind of looking for or looking into? Yes, yeah, so I was probably the student who actually really was not thinking about disability so much in the college search process. I chose my undergrad institution based on the, it had the right combination of academic programs and extracurriculars. And so I ended up with a very rough college transition I got, was accepted, I got into the honors program, but I was really without the support I needed for a successful experience. I found myself really leaning a lot on advisors and resident assistants who like, frankly, you know, were not prepared, did not know what to do. And eventually I was asked to take a leave of absence for being that I was a drain on college resources. That was actually what I was told, which I didn't do that. And I did find some better accommodations that worked for me. We shifted into a private dorm room. I actually, I got an emotional support animal. And eventually I felt a little more supported and able to take on college, but the first few semesters were really a challenge. So I've been trying to do it very differently in grad school. You know, I've, I'm in a situation where I can be very upfront about having disabilities and health conditions, and that sort of made connecting to advisors and finding people who would be supportive a whole lot easier. Yeah. and and. It, I, it's sometimes it's really tricky because you, you don't know often prior to going into that situation like what your needs are going to be right and so 
Um, that's where having a disability support office that can engage the student in a holistic and comprehensive process can be really, really helpful. And I often tell students too, like you're, you're a consumer in this process as well. So you wanna make sure that you're connecting with the people um, that are gonna be supporting you and, and vetting them too, and making sure that they're the right people for you. So there, there's a lot to consider. Um, and so what, what, where did you, where have you both kind of sought support besides the disability support offices on your campuses? Were there other offices that you reached out to or that, that you know that students use to, to assist them and support them? And Val, do you wanna go first? Yeah, so um, I would say in undergrad, one of the biggest resources that I had um, was, I was a part of a disability student organization um, that really had a lot of upper class uh, folks that were really aware of disability um, and had a bunch of different disabilities and really created a support environment for me. It was one of a real life changing experience for me. And then um, in graduate school, I really lean a lot on my professors. Um, I have been really intentional on making sure that a lot of the professors that I'm working with um, individually have disabilities. And so that has been really helpful because um, they understand kind of my experience a little bit better and are really able to work with me, which is something that you see a lot more in graduate school. Um, the other thing that I think is really helpful right now is um, Ohio has uh, voc rehab counselors as part of disability services offices um, that are connected. And I um, I just think that my voc rehab counselor in Ohio has been amazing. So I really like that system where they have um, a voc rehab counselor that's really connected to the college campus. Great, thanks. And Rebecca, Eli, did you have other kind of supports that you've used or that you know that folks use on campus? Yeah, I think folks have used a lot of programs for students with learning differences or disabilities. Those programs I've seen be really helpful in college transition. Think back to my undergrad experience, I feel like I really sort of had to carve out a space that would be supportive for me by starting student organization and student clubs. Uh, great program that I actually did in the, I guess, after the first year of my master's program that was super helpful with me developing self-advocacy skills for anyone who is supporting an autistic student. The autistic, autistic self-advocacy organization has a great training for self-advocacy for autistic college students at any level. So that was fantastic with not only teaching me how to build a local support network on my campus, but for letting me, giving me connections to students with similar experiences to mine sort of all over the country. And that's the, honestly the internet and social media has been a great place for me to build support. Yeah, and that's great. And that's a perfect segue. Let's go to slide 30, which I think I forgot to go ahead to. So there are uh, their beautiful their beautiful faces. <laughs> Val on the left, a picture of Val on the left and a picture of Rebecca Eli on the right. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, and I'll let you guys take it over and talk about support networks and tools. Okay, uh, so we're gonna go over some support networks and tools. I'm gonna turn to slide 32. So uh, I want to talk about our organization, which is DREAM, which is Disability Rights, Education, Activism, and Mentoring. Um, you can see uh, a picture of an event that we did uh, during 2020, which was uh, hashtag low on spoons. Um, and there's a picture of a hand holding a spoon um, as a powerful thing, which is related to spoon theory, if you're familiar, um, which uh, is a way to describe uh, chronic illness or mental health disabilities particularly. Um, so DREAM is a coalition of college disability organizations. We have multiple different um, college chapters across the country, which are either affiliates 
or um, called Dream as a whole. So that would be something if you're looking for support on campus to specifically search for. Um, nationally, we create resource guides. So right now, um, Rebecca, Eli, and I are working on a graduate organization one of kinds of specific things when you're transitioning to graduate school. Um, we're also working on one about campus policy and how you can advocate for change to make your policies more accessible. Uh, as I speak, spoke a little bit about our Low on Spoons event, um, we also do webinars. Um, we've also had a Disabled and Proud conference, which was a national conference uh, for disabled college students. So those are some of the things uh, DREAM does. And we also provide advocacy and support for college students. So if you have questions about um, different disabilities um, related to college, we will help um, provide different answers and support in those areas. Going on to 33. Uh, so other college supports I wanted to talk about is their different disability cultural centers. Disability cultural centers are a community center for folks with disabilities, sometimes connected to disability services, sometimes very different. Um, uh, separation and so it's really creating community space, um, different things around disability that is not related to accommodations. We're starting to see these spark up around the country. I think they're at 10 or 12 different disability cultural centers nationally. I also wanted to discuss TRIO. So TRIO is a great resource. It has different um, academic support. It's a federally funded grant that specifically targets uh, low-income students, first-generation students, and then students with disabilities. Uh, oftentimes, sometimes disability isn't as covered, um, so it's really something to look for, and it provides a lot of different academic support for students with disabilities. Um, also, I wanted to shout out to women, LGBT, and multicultural centers. These centers provide different resources um, that can connect to intersectionality or to um, different identity groups, but one of the things that I particularly find important for um, specifically mental health conditions and um, health uh, chronic health conditions in general is that they often are a physical space. So they might have couches, you might be able to nap in their space. So if you are drained throughout the day, they're a physical space that you can take a break, which I think is really important for a lot of different um areas and they're also a place that really looks at advocacy in a bunch of ways um, from focusing on diversity so if your sent your campus doesn't have a disability cultural center these centers really provide support for students in general to advocate for different um, diversity issues on campus uh, one is counseling centers um, i uh, specifically there have been mentioned throughout so they're helpful but at times have caps. What I've found is rural schools are less likely to have caps because there are less aspects of the community. Um, whereas if I am in a more urban setting, um, there has been more caps placed on the uh, counseling center. So those are things to consider when working with counseling centers. Um, there's also a lot of times psychological testing centers that are connected to college and universities. These often provide low cost testing for different psychological um, conditions. Uh, oftentimes they're a lot cheaper than the ones that you might find in a community. Um, uh, oftentimes they're very hidden on college websites uh, and I highly recommend those. Um, there's also a Dean of Students office, which most universities have. Deans of Students are kind of your catch-all for any issue you have on campus. Um, they might be a place that you, if you have a concern about a student, if you have any issue that you want to speak through, they're like kind of a catch-all for helping students find where they need to go on campus. NAMI is a group like DREAM that provides a lot of different um, organizational support for um, mental health um, and mental illness. They often have chapters on college campuses. JED is a foundation that looks at different policies around um, mental illness and specifically looks at um, medical leave policies. They've really been doing a lot for different universities on providing different specific mental health policies 
um, that have come from mental health advocates. And so if you're looking for uh, different colleges and universities, sometimes they'll say they're a JED approved policy. That would be something to look at. Um, different organizations also cover different types of disabilities. Um, so you might find an organization for your specific disability on a college campus. And then as I mentioned before, uh, Ohio, and then I've also been at school in Iowa, where the voc rehab um, counselors are specifically integrated within disability services and really create a very connected um, tool and really create like a team of disability experts that allow you to work at different um, types of institutions. And I think that's really helpful. Next slide, um, going on to slide 34. Um, so the National Center for College Students with Disabilities is another useful site that you can go to. Um, it's a federally funded center. We are currently at DREAM, housed with underneath it. Um, they also have a lot of different questions and concerns for college students and educators that they will answer. Um, so if you have any concerns or questions that you're trying to figure out, there are great resources to reach out to. Um, they also create different research around different college students' experiences. Um, they have different supports and services that might be helpful as you're going through the college experience. Um, and they are housed within a head, which is the professional home of disability services professionals. And then I will go on to slide 35. So CEDAR is a national database of different um, colleges and universities um, and about their disability services or disability per, um, things they provide on a college campus. Uh, CEDAR, you, um, I have a picture of uh, what the CEDAR database looks like when you can type in a search. So it will have a search name and you can type in what university you're looking for or you might like look at like schools in Ohio. So there's a select that you can choose the state. Um, some universities gave information to this database, but we'll say like more descriptive information um, that will be going on in depth in the next slide. But also there are, are pretty much, if you're looking for um, where is disability housed within a university, you can find it on CEDAR. So for instance, a large university will have like a disability support services, but a smaller university might have one person who does like eight things. And so this website, like if you're trying to come up with the name of the person that does eight things and it doesn't have disability in the title, uh, this will provide you a way to find those people. Um, and then we will go on to slide 36. So this is an example of what you will find in the CEDAR database. This is a screenshot of the accessibility services for the school that I currently go to, which is Bowling Green State University. Bowling Green State University has two offices of disability for our two different types of campuses. It will show how many full-time staff members that the um, office has. So we have four at Bowling Green, and we have a thousand students with disabilities on campus. It also provides the percentage of how many um, disability services folks are, people uh, receive disability services on college campus. So there's five, about 5% 5 of students at BG per get college accommodations. Uh, as Annie said, 19% of college students with disabilities um, exists. So 5% is not, not that high. Um, and so it's something that you want to look at is how close to the 19 or maybe even 10% um, would this college or university have because they're more likely to be able to accommodate for students. Um, also looking at that range of how many, um, how many people a uh, disability services professional sees. For instance, um, the average case for uh, disability services professionals is 133. So anything higher than 133 might create a pause for you of, oh, they have one person doing a thousand 
um, students with disabilities that might be problematic. And then we'll go on to slide 37. Um, this is an example of some of the more information you can find on that CR database. Um, so it will show, for instance, this is another screenshot. So it says other accommodations, and it says group of accommodations, and it has a list of different accommodations. And then it shows a level of service, and it can show commonly provided, provided occasionally, or not provided. Um, the commonly and provided occasionally seems to not be consistent throughout the database, so it's less important. But if you see that it's not accommodated for or it's not regularly accommodated for, that would be also kind of like a red flag that if this is an accommodation you need and they're not as familiar with it, it might cause more problems through your accommodation process. Uh, so this is a database that I think is very helpful when looking at um, different accommodations in college. And I'm going to turn it over to Annie. Great, I'm back. At, and slide 38. Yeah, let's, so um, I, we're, we're going to jump into questions in a second. Um, before we do that, I wanted to make sure that we gave out our contact information. So if people are interested in learning more about Accessible College, um, you can go to my website, accessiblecollege.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm all, all under Accessible College, so you can find me there. Go to slide 39, please. Um, and Rebecca Eli has her contact information here as well. She's on Twitter and her email address, and then Val has already has put in her, her email address too. Um, so if folks want to contact us, you can feel free to do that. Let's go to slide 40. And we will take questions. And I will let Anne kind of help us navigate that process. Yes, Annie, we had some good questions coming in. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for that fabulous information. I Two things that really stood out to me, the whole concept of self-advocacy fatigue. Uh, we need to coin that phrase and we need to quantify it and talk about it. And, um, you know, Rebecca, Eli, I can't underscore what you said enough. It's uh, people have no idea how much energy goes into the self-advocacy process, particularly on a college campus and trying to navigate that. So I think it's a great topic to talk about. We could probably do a webinar on that. Um, and then the other thing that stood out was, good job, Ohio, for having vocational rehabilitation counselors connected with their disability support services office. That's the first time I've heard of that. So, um, so uh, first question, if having a single room or a single bathroom means an added cost to the student, how does the university deal with this when it is a requested accommodation? I can, I can start and then if Rebecca wants to talk about her, ex their experience, they can do that. Um, so the way that it's supposed to work is um, you can't you can't charge someone more for right. a single room if it's an accommodation. So the student would have to follow the process to request the housing accommodation, provide documentation that supports that request, um, and the university would not be able to charge them more for a single room or for a bathroom. Um, uh, you know, sometimes this comes up too with students who have personal care attendants. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you you might need a student who has a physical disability might need a double room if they need a personal care attendant to be in that space too. So um, you can't charge a student more for that. But Rebecca, Eli, do you do you want to talk about your or would you be willing to talk about yeah, your personal? Sure. So I will just say really briefly that I was able to get a single room at no additional cost. But the university was really happy to let me out of my housing contract when I had a change of plans. I'd also say that, you know, accommodations that cost the university money can be a little harder to get. I've encountered this with a note taker where the note taker is a paid position. And I think that's a really why I've had some hard, some hard times getting that accommodation in place at my current institution is, you know, DRC our offices of disability resources can be strapped for cash sometimes, especially with COVID budget cutbacks. That has been something I've experienced where accommodations that cost the money, they 
you know, honestly they are less willing to provide it or will scrutinize that request a lot more closely. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, from somebody who, I'm summarizing the question, what if you were diagnosed with um, multiple disabilities as an adult and are not sure what accommodations you may need? So you have no idea what, how that would translate to a college setting. Where, where would you begin? Um, I can start and then if you guys want to fill in, that's fine. Um, so I, I would start with like condition specific websites. So like there are a lot of condition specific organizations, the College Diabetes Network, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, mm -hmm. DREAM, the National Center for College Students with Disabilities. There's a ton of resources there. You can also look to websites like JAN, the Job Accommodation yeah. Network. Um, because sometimes the, the, it's all the ADA, so many of those accommodations can kind of translate to a college setting as well. So I would start with those pieces. Sometimes you'll also find a disability support office person who is kind and informed and will sit down and talk you through, okay, this is what I'm hearing from you and this is what I'm reading in your documentation about your functional limitations. Here are some things that I, re I would recommend that you might mm -hmm. want to consider for accommodations. So um, there's kind of multiple ways to, to gather that information. And then Val and Rebecca, Eli, do you have anything to add on that? I guess one of the things is I was diagnosed, I had some disabilities um, in undergrad where those were the, com the disabilities I had for a long time, I knew those accommodations. And then I've had a couple that have added on um, throughout my adult life. And so those changed. And um, so really um, those have been like kind of a try and test out procedure. Like there's certain things that like, if you're working with your accommodation, you can like say like, oh, I'm going to ask for these mm -hmm. things and I'm going to try them out and see if they work. Um, one of the big things I would say is ask for more. Um, so if you think you might need an accommodation, ask for it at the beginning of your meeting with disability services. If you're like not sure if this will work, ask for it and you can always not use it, but it's harder sometimes to add on uh, an accommodation later on depending on your disability services provider. Great. Thank you. And uh, Hannah Goodwin, this is an excellent, excellent question. And Annie, I would love for you to tackle this one. I understand accommodations, services, and approach vary from school to school, but isn't there a baseline given the guidelines of the ADA? Is there a baseline or foundation that prospective students can expect? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky question because, yes, there's a baseline. Most of the baseline is established by case law, by litigation, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there are typical accommodations that one might expect. Most disability support offices outline on their websites what the typical accommodations are that they give. For me, for the students that I work with who have physical disabilities and health conditions, they're usually outside of the typical kind of things. <laughs> so there are there are things that they might need that are reasonable requests and have been uh, borne out in, in cases and people have received those accommodations. Um, and those are a little bit more nuanced. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think like you can go to some of the resources like the CEDAR database um, that Val showed us that's on the National Center for College Students with Disabilities website and, and the DREAM website as well. Those are all connected websites. So once you're at one, you can find the other ones. Um, and that is that's where you'll see some of the baseline things. But for again, for many of the students that I work with, some of the things that they're they need they need are a little bit outside of the typical scope of what colleges might provide. So um, it depends on who the student is, I guess, and what their needs are. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's very helpful. And I think that we will see this area evolve over time, as we've seen over the last 31 years. Um, it's evolving a little slowly, but it's it's still evolving. So um, 
another question, and we're getting close to the end here. I'm my eye on the clock. How would accommodations translate to an adult education program within a K-12 school division? So it's within the K-12 school division, but it's an adult education program. That's a great question. So if there's still, it, it, this is probably for a, a person with a developmental disability. Um, and so I think if they're still in that K through 12 setting, they would receive the same supports and services up to age 21, I believe. And that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise. <laughs> but since I've worked in the DD world in the past, I have one toe, um, so I can kind of understand that question. So it's, um, so the accommodations should be the same if they're continuing on in that K through 12 setting to go on to a vocational program or an adult training program. Um, if, if a student is going on to a community college or um, going on to a vocational training program or, or to, to Job Corps or another type of setting like that, then there's a different process to request accommodations through those, through those programs. And, that. Yeah, no, and they're crossing from entitlement to eligibility and that that line. Whoever asked that question, I think there's more information we need here. So call the 1-800-949-4232 and we can um, go back and forth and, and get some additional information. And they're um, the just FYI, Annie, they're funded till 22. So through their 21st year. So. Um, so, and we'll get some more information on that one. And the last but not least, and I think we have some time for you to address this. Um, what, why doesn't the college recognize IEPs? So the, this, this questioner asked, you know, I went to an out-of-state school that did not recognize my IEP. Um, it was from Ohio to Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, why, why, why does that happen? And is, is that widespread? I can take this and then I'll hand it over to Val because I see her nodding feverishly. Um, <laughs> so, so, so um, it's a different law. So yeah. IDEA is the law that covers IEPs. Once your student matriculates to college, they sign that dotted line, the ADA kicks in. So your I, IEP does not automatically transfer to the college setting. There is, however, a um, an, an act which I, Val, do you want to talk about it? You're nodding. I'm going to hand it over to Val. Okay. You there know. is an act called the Rise Act that is working to have IEPs count. So if you are, um, I would advocate uh, reaching out to your representatives about the Rise Act. Um, it will be a great act that looks at having IEPs count. Um, Two of the things that I would say is some IEPs, depending on the state, provide better or worse information about the disability. I know when I was in Iowa, um, they wouldn't actually put any diagnosis on the IEP. And so it really caused a lot of problems for the disability services professionals to even figure out what they might need. Um, and then also, but I would say it should, but legally they don't have to and right. unless the riot act passes okay thank you thank all three of you um val annie and rebecca eli this is this has really been fabulous we can't thank you enough slide 42 please um, thank you again. Thank all three of you for joining us. This is great. We could do a whole nother webinar on IEPs and how they translate into college and how accommodations should translate into uh, the college setting as well. So more, more to come down the road. Um, again, Annie, I'll, I'll let you have the last word here. No, thanks everybody for joining us and don't hesitate to reach out. Um, if you look back in the presentation, you can find our contact information. We're happy to engage with everyone. So thanks so much.